Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Come Again by Robert Webb. So Robert Webb is one half of Mitchell and Webb. Hang on, we've got a big picture of him here, you might recognise him. He also had this, I've read that, uh, that's his memoir, How Not To Be A Boy, that was very good. This is his first novel as far as I can tell. I'm going to go through and read the blurb, then I'm going to go and check out my um, tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... First love, second time lucky. All hell has broken loose in Kate Marsden's life. Her husband has died, she's lost her job, and now she's pushed the last of her friends away. Then one day, she wakes up in the wrong body and the wrong year. She's 18 again, and it's her first day of university, which means today is the day she'll meet Luke, her future husband, for the first time. If they can fall in love again, Kate might just be able to save him the second time around. So it's set, separated into parts. Part one is, is called Come Undone, and that just made me think of the uh, Robbie Williams song. So Charles, Kate's boss, uh, she knows him from university and we do get to see him. He basically works cleaning up people's online reputations <laughs> and we get, um, he didn't go to, um, to what's his name, to, um, what's his name? Luke. She, Charles didn't go to Luke's funeral even though they, they all knew each other at uni. He said, well you know I missed the funeral because I was advising Prince Andrew on a certain matter. And yes I can imagine he was advising Prince Andrew considering his job is to Again, clean up reputations. If you're a paedophile, it makes all relevant results about you being a paedophile. Go on to page six of Google and things like that, you know? So Kate is just drinking herself into oblivion. She's basically trying to kill herself with alcohol um, because obviously she misses her husband. And uh, she's not cleaning her house up and a mouse comes and she ends up chatting to this mouse. But um, we also get this bit while she's talking to the mouse because she was into theatre. Um, she goes... Uh, actually, I know exactly where for. It doesn't mean where, by the way. It means why, as I'm sure you know. Not where are you, Romeo, but why are you, Romeo? Like, why do you have to be Romeo? Why couldn't I fall in love with someone safer? And it tells you a lot about her state of mind that she's talking about this to a mouse. So she's thinking back to when she first met Luke. Um, she, she talks about um, women and feminism, and I think this is quite nice. Well, not nice, but it's interesting. Um, my mother would call it women's intuition. I call it paying attention. Women are interested in how men's funny minds work because we might need that knowledge to survive. So we end up anticipating things and it looks like a magic trick. His expression didn't falter. Another encouraging sign. He could take a bit of feminism on the chin without moaning. Good. And then later on we get, um... Kate wondered what the hell she was doing. Rule number one of getting laid was don't tell boys you've been assaulted. She sensed him trying to control his alarm and come to his rescue. It was a groping, nothing serious. I mean, it was serious. You're really not supposed to feel up a 13-year-old on a geography field trip. Bloody hell, a teacher. Kate nodded, but nothing horrifying. At least I didn't think so, but maybe I was playing it down. Maybe you still are. And she says her dad was all for killing the bastard, but she couldn't tell her mother. Uh, she would have just said, darling, this is what comes of wearing scarlet leg warmers. Uh, dad was going to run, run him over in his taxi. But that's how she got into doing karate, and she ended up becoming like a national champion. So she's thinking about when... Um, when she was speaking to a doctor after um, after Luke was diagnosed with a tumour. Um, she says, almost, the doctor said it's almost symptomless. Um, did he ever show excessive irritability? Kate frowned as if she'd just been asked the stupidest possible question. He was a writer. And um, Kate gets, at the same time as all this is going on, Kate gets involved in sort of a scandal, I suppose. Uh, one of the clients of Charles, her boss, um, he's this like Russian oligarch who's also been on Have I Got News For You. I just think of him as being a bit like a Russian Boris Johnson. Um, he owns a football club as well and um, he, his company has accidentally sent Charles this bit of footage which is very clearly a deep fake but it's very well done. And we get, as far as Kate was aware, up until now the necessary AI had been unequal to the challenge of fooling the human viewer at this level but this was different. Kate took a gulp of her pre-lunch wine and tried to remain calm. The technical brilliance was dazzling, but the implications filled her with alarm. Whoever had created this wanted the viewer to fully comprehend its artifice. This wasn't a bit of fun. This was a warning. If they could do this, they could do anything. Robert De Niro secretly filmed at a party making racist jokes. A video conference call in which George W. Bush planned the destruction of the Twin Towers. Paparazzi footage of the German Chancellor on holiday slapping the pool boy. An admission of murder here, a declaration of war there. The mind boggled. The message was unequivocal. All bets are off. You can never trust anything you see on a screen ever again. And I think that's quite an interesting little plot, you know, plot device. It's um, very now, you know, but it again, it highlights some concerns that we all need to think about and ask the reader where they stand on, on the question, you know. Great little quote here. Um, a homicide kills one person, a suicide kills the whole world. 
you get the line, there is nothing so reassuringly dull as what your father does for a living. Um, and it's kind of true, her dad was a London taxi driver, my dad was an accountant. But if I ever have kids, I hope, hopefully my writing career won't be that dull to them. And her dad, as he's teaching her to drive, he says, keep your eyes just a bit further down the road, love. Nasty surprises everywhere, but not so many if you're looking ahead. Is that some kind of life lesson? No, it's some kind of driving lesson, Mrs. Metaphorical. And Bill says, to be fair, it's really just a work in the car lesson. Proper driving is about other drivers. Who's about to cut in? Who's about to act like a lemon? Who's about to signal left and then turn right? All that. So we learn a little bit more about the groping incident along with how her family uh, reacted to it. So her father, Bill. Uh, Bill knew that at school she'd learned to dissemble. That she kept a private rule of raising her hand only once every 10 minutes and sometimes got answers deliberately wrong. The incident with Blanchard, the gropey geographer, had given ammunition to Madeline's ongoing campaign to have Kate privately educated, despite her knowing perfectly well that they couldn't afford it. Bill's socialist principles notwithstanding, his wife had no answer when he said, what, so she can attract a better class of groper? But also, it did say earlier that she hadn't told her mum about it. So she's thinking about killing herself, basically, and um, as she walks along, she goes, Jesus, what is this? Some kind of a parable or a Mr. Man book? Little Miss Top herself, which I th didn't make me chuckle, even though it's dark, because I used to read the Mr. Man book. We get reference to Brett Easton Ellis, one of Luke's favourite authors, and um, she's thinking back to Luke's attempt to write a novel that wasn't very good and uh, constantly stupidly encouraging him when all the time it turns out that the appropriate response to reading that stuff was you need to see a doctor. Ever tried saying that to a writer? It really doesn't go down well. And so her friend Toby has been around to, um, to, to, to tidy up basically. He knows that she's struggling. At least Toby hadn't touched her bedroom. Bad enough that he'd been rootling around downstairs with the fag packets and takeaway trays. At least she didn't have to imagine him organising her underwear drawer and frowning with concern as he noted Dirk the dildo had run out of batteries. Karen Bastard would have probably replaced them. She flopped onto her bed with her phone in hand. Hey Siri, she said flatly as the phone beeped to attention. Wake me up around four so I can do myself in. Sure thing, replied the female voice. I've set an alarm for 4pm. Kate tapped the icon and the phone chimed again. Just for the record, Siri, I've always thought you were a cold-hearted shit. Okay, and then we move on to the next section, Come Dancing, where she sort of goes back in time to when she was at college. And she's, she can't see to begin with. 2020 vision had become 2020 vision um, because she'd had laser surgery, so now she has to wear glasses again. We get this little line. Another philanderer, Boris Johnson, was still just a frivolous hack rather than a frivolous prime minister. Kate assumed that between the sheets of the Daily Telegraph, an admired column of his about Europe trying to straighten our bananas was already pushing its tiny erection into the back of a sleeping nation. She vaguely wondered if she'd been sent back in time to strangle the lion bastard. Probably not. It does make you wonder what would have happened though. And uh, Luke's greatest fear, his most secret dread, is that he's afraid that he was boring. Which I think a lot of us are afraid of. And Kate's reading Luke's manuscript again, um, and she goes, uh, there were idle literary illusions which went nowhere. These could have been half good if they had anything to do with the story, but they didn't and so were fully bad. This was mainly because there was no actual story. Luke wasn't writing a story. He was having a wank. One where neither he nor the reader would ever come. Kate reflected that if Luke taped himself for having an actual wank, there would at least be a market for that, and at least it would end. She's thinking to herself, she had tried never to take the word witch as an insult, even when that was the intention. A witch was just an eccentric woman who tried to heal people in ways which too often provoked fear. Yep, she'd been a witch all right. Uh, she sort of does save his life. But not by, her idea was she was going to say to him, look, you've got a tumour growing in your head, you need to go and get that sorted out. That's not what happens. She accidentally knocks him down some stairs and he hits his head and the doctors find it. But that's one way of doing things, you know. Uh, so we get this great line which goes, I know that beautiful women never want to hear that they're beautiful because either they know already or they don't agree. Either way, they've heard it all before. And um, so this is Bill talking about when he met her mother, Madeline. Um, she says, I'm just Madeline through. And he says, yeah, we're all just muddling through, love. Anyway, let's have a fucking dance. She's not sure whether he, this was meant to be a joke or not, and she was considered asking about it, but she says some stories you don't want that clarification for. It's better when it's left ambiguous. And they actually bonded because both of their parents were very deep right wing. Uh, I mean, Bill's dad was actually a fascist. Um, and Kate says, well, those days are gone, aren't they? Maybe, said Bill, but you've always got to keep your eye out. He went to the kettle and tested his weight. They don't come with a calling card anymore, not since the war. They don't kick the door down and say, hello, we're the Nazis. He took the kettle to the sink and filled it, but they'll be back one way or another. Kate watched him replace the kettle and reach for a couple of mugs. She said, because people are always gonna go through hard times and there's always gonna be scared politicians. Yeah, said Bill. That and the fact that some people are just assholes. All right, and then we get back to the future, as it were, even though it's the past now, but it was the present at the time of writing. and she kind of ends up back in 2020. 
And she's trying to figure out what to do with this USB drive that she's got that shows uh, this deep fake and that could cause a lot of trouble. Um, and she ends up, she jumps into the back of a black cab and says, help me, help me. The driver was another overweight white guy in his 40s. Jesus, they were everywhere. He looked up to see the short woman being pursued by four blokes. He put down his son newspaper and stood, still holding his large subway roll. What the bloody hell's this then? They work for Uber, Kate yelled. They what? They work for Uber and they didn't like my review. They've been using the they've been using the bus lane during prescribed hours. The driver was instantly livid. He fucking knew it, Uber wankers. Um, and then, you know, he decides to step up to her defence. I just made me laugh. So yes, and it turns out that Toby is a spy. Uh, he's got a little bolt hole in Kez's theatre. All of these are old, you know, old uni friends. And Toby arrives and saves the day. He points at one of the heavies and says, Right then, you, you and you, you're under arrest under the Prevention of Dickheads Act 2008. That's not a real law, protested one of the heavies. That's okay, we're not real policemen. All right, then we have an epilogue nine months later. And of course, Kate and Toby are together. Um, she's learned when she went back in time to meet Luke, basically she realized you can't fall in love for the first time a second time again. The, per the Luke that she loved is very different to the Luke that she had first met, but she was very different when she first met him. And actually, Toby was always the one for her anyway. Uh, so now she owns a bookstore and um, they put celebrity attendants never did the shop any harm and Danielle had asked them to give a reading from their latest work in the hope that they would have the tact to say no. They had all done so with the exception of a YouTube star turned children's writer. The poor dear will be reading some of it for the first time Daniel said. Let's hope her ghostwriter hasn't suddenly branched out into words of more than two syllables. So they got Zoella I think is what. <laughs> And of course, it turns out that Luke did survive. He's actually written a book about the girl from the future and how that, um, how they're b bumping into each other, influence one another. And then in the acknowledgements, obviously Robert Webb worked closely with David Mitchell, who's another person I deeply admire. And in his acknowledgements, he said, God knows what I've stolen from David Mitchell. Every so often I came across an idea or a turn of phrase and thought, was that me just now or was that David in 1996? David had no influence on this particular book and every imaginal influence on the writer who wrote it. I'm going to have to thank him forever, aren't I? Yes, thank you, David. So yes, Come Again by Robert Webb, a pretty decent novel. Um, it's not going to be mind-blowing. It actually has quite a lot in common with um, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, which I read recently. They both have female first characters, uh, female main characters. In, in Haig's book, she was a champion swimmer. In Webb's book, she was a champion karate expert. Um, they're both given a chance to see what would happen if they made decisions differently and kind of see the effect of the decisions we make today and how they affect the, the you know, the lives that we live in tomorrow. Um, but I like all that kind of stuff. It was pretty well written. Um, bits of it, I don't know if it were, were that necessary. Um, you know, the whole, even the whole Secret Service plot and all of that stuff, I don't really, it didn't really go well with the rest of the book. That in itself could have been a novel on its own, you know. Um, but yeah, overall it was pretty good. I gave Come Again by Robert Webb a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I made of Come Again by Robert Webb. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you've read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.